One, two, one, two, three, four. Hey everybody, welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. We're incredibly excited today to have a special show. This show is coming to you from uh, an event that we held in New York on October 17th. That event is called the Revenue Collective Executive Offsite. And what we did there was we brought about 80 to 90 members of the Revenue Collective from all over the world together to hear and listen to and learn from each other and from some of the speakers. Now, this speaker, his name is John Kaplan. He's the president and co-founder of Force Management. If you're not familiar with Force, they're one of the firms and the organizations that really popularized the concept of medic and of really enterprise sales as a process, both as an art and a science. And John talks through how to drive organizational alignment and how to prepare your entire organization for delivering and executing against a difficult enterprise sale. So it's a really interesting conversation. And we had a lot of fun uh, doing it live. Now, before we dive into the conversation, of course, we want to thank our sponsors. The first is Vidyard. Email isn't dead, but it sure is boring. Add video to your emails to stand out in the inbox for free with Vidyard. Vidyard helps you easily record, send, and track who is viewing your video content in three simple steps. First, easily record yourself or your, or your screen on camera right from your browser. Then share your videos and emails with just a few clicks. And finally, see when someone watches your videos and look at the analytics. Get Vidyard for free by using and visiting vidyard.com forward slash sales hacker. Our second sponsor is Outreach, the leading sales engagement platform. Outreach supports sales reps by enabling them to humanize communications at scale from automating the soul-sucking manual work that eats up selling time to providing action-oriented tips on what communications are working best. Outreach has your back. Now, without further ado, let's listen to John Kaplan from Force Management. So the next, the next conversation we're going to have is going to be uh, much more operational. Thanks again to Kelly, if you're still in the room. Kelly, amazing, amazing conversation. And honestly, getting somebody from the investment community to come in and be that candid and that authentic is just really special and, and, and awesome. So thank you. And we're, we're equally excited and honored to have our next guest. If you haven't heard of or aren't familiar with Force Management, besides being one of the partners of Revenue Collective, they are some of the folks that I'd always been told essentially invented or at least popularized medic as an enterprise sales qualification methodology. They are in every conversation about the best enterprise sales consulting and training companies. And I probably would have had them on the show and at the conference regardless, but we're, we're incredibly excited to partner with them. They just do incredibly exceptional work. And so today we're going to be talking to John Kaplan, who is one of the founders, if not the sole founder, one of the founders, one of the founders of Force Management and a managing partner. Let me just quickly tell you about his bio. He's a skilled consultant, presenter, and facilitator. Over 20 years of executive experience in sales leadership and execution, specializing in corporate sales strategy and performance management. Before co-founding Force, he was SVP of International Sales Operations for PTC, a leading software developer for content, product lifecycle management. PTC and Oracle are essentially the two birthplaces of most well-known enterprise sales leaders. Before PTC, nine years at Xerox in sales, sales management and sales development, a graduate of Bowling Green State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in business administration. John, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are a little awkward. <laughs> Those bios are a little awkward. Hey, couple things. Um, Make sure you hold the uh, mic close to your mouth. Okay. Yeah. You think I would know how to do that. It's okay. First of all, my hat's off to you, Sam, and this Revenue Collective, I think, is just an incredible uh, value-add experience and uh, really, really relevant content and, and experiences for you guys. And then the second thing I just wanted to share with you to encourage you is I have a tremendous amount of respect for any professional. I'm obviously very biased to sales and marketing professionals. I've been a sales and marketing person my entire life, uh, my entire professional life. But the commitment to hone your craft um, is something that I, uh, I really respect. And uh, I just wanted to encourage you, you know, you're surrounded. I had some talking to Steve from San Francisco. I just surrounded with really, really great talent in this room. And I would encourage you to continue those sharing those experiences. I'm just uh, I'm very, very impressed with what you guys have built. Well, thank you. Well we're, done. We're excited to have you here. So let's give you the opportunity. I just gave the elevator pitch for Force, but 
quickly before we dive into the content, tell us what is Force, what do you do, who are you useful for, how do you do it, all that good stuff. Yeah, so Force Management is a sales effectiveness company. I think we're going on our 16th year. We actually started the business 16 years ago. We're former, the two founders, myself and Grant Wilson, our former PTC executives. And any of you guys have heard of PTC before? Okay, so some of you in the room. They were one of the most dynamic software companies on the planet. They went from zero to a billion dollars in less than 10 years. The stock split five times in seven years. What they were really, really well known for was their predictability on Wall Street. So they, they went 43 straight quarters without missing their number to Wall Street. And that's double digit revenue and profitability. So that's 10 years, which is really, really incredible. Now, I, I didn't do that. I would just happen to be a, a, one of the uh, sales leaders there. But I was, how, how Force Management got started, I was working in Europe, living in Europe with my family. I had three children. We went over to Europe for an assignment over there to run. Where in Europe? I lived in uh, Frankfurt, Germany, uh, outside of Frankfurt in a little town called Bad Soden. And um, I started off as a country manager there, and then I, I started to take on more and more responsibility. And what typically happens with expats is if you're any good, or I don't know if they don't have a spot for you back in the United States, they keep you there. So I wound up there for five years. And um, I just wanted to come home. I wanted my I wanted my children to grow up in the United States, nothing against any of the cultures. It was a, unbelievable. Two of my children are fluent in German. They went back and went to school there at Mannheim University. So it was a wonderful experience, but I just wanted to come home and uh, you know, started force management on a whim. Basically, my father had passed away the year before and uh, he was an incredible, incredible human being. And he knew how to make a life. He didn't, he probably wouldn't show up in the box scores as a great success from a, uh, like how we would measure success in this room, or I definitely, I changed my measurement of success after his passing. And we started Force Management as a lifestyle company. And uh, we just tried to replace our corporate incomes. And then we had a relevant point of view. We didn't invent Medic. Medic was invented at PTC, but we didn't invent it. We just happened to operationalize it and bring it to, as a qualification criteria. We kind of had a relevant point of view. Sales was drastically changing from an enterprise model to a more an engagement model with multiple touches. And we, I just, I'd love to tell you it was a great planned, great capitalized, uh, you know, we bootstrapped it, used our own money, got really, really lucky. And 16 years later, here we are. That's awesome. And who do you, who is your ideal customer profile? You know, if some of the yeah. folks in here want to use Force, who would be the right fit? It's a really good question because we actually do this with our customers. We say, yeah, who's your ideal customer? And companies that have ideal customers are really that much better than every customer is not a great customer. Any, you know, you go to a company, you say, who's your ideal customer? And they don't have, that's actually one of the criteria that we use to help companies. But for us, when you think about, we'll share some of the principles that we focus on, but you know, it really all starts with the men and women in this room. And what I mean is, is when there is a strong sales leader in the room, and I'm not discounting marketing, I'll talk about the marketing folks in a moment. Marketing has drastically changed from when I was growing up uh, to what it provides today and what it does today. But we, our customer is typically the CRO or the VP of sales. And when you have a very, very strong, and when I say a very, very strong VP of sales, that they know that sales training and development is not an event, it's a process. And when they're committed to that, and when they're committed to attaching that to a critical business issue and make it a kind of a top three priority for the company, and so therefore it aligns to some significant business issues, they have the ability to, and the presence, to collaborate. I'm going to share a lot more on this because I'm also talking about what I'm going to encourage you to do in your roles, to collaborate and get the company to align. It doesn't matter what you're selling. When you, when you think about the principles we're going to share with you, it doesn't matter what you're selling. I don't care if you're selling water. You still have to differentiate. You still have to operationalize and put the right people in the right places. You still have to put together the plan to make the plan. And you still got to have a great ability to attract and retain top talent. And those are kind of the four areas that we typically wrap our arms around. But our ideal customer 
it all starts with that individual that gets it. That's like, you know, sales training is an event, but development of a sales organization to highly differentiate yourself from an operational and a customer experience perspective is really, really where we tend to focus our resources. And is it fair to say that, because this is a massive trend across the high growth ecosystem, there's lots and lots of companies that start off at the SMB or commercial level, and they want to build enterprise sales muscles, but they do not have that experience or expertise. Is that a good moment maybe to think about calling you guys? Well, it's really good. So when we talk about like kind of the four areas that we're gonna talk about, we put some stuff, hopefully this is, I know it's not interactive, you got live streaming going on that, we'll try to make it as best we can but we put some stuff on the table. All of these principles of these kind of four areas of effectiveness, and you can start to look at those, they should be on the tables, they look like four quadrants. All of those areas that are really critically important, and they're critically important at different stages, and they mean different things to different stages. So a lot of times people look at us and they say, oh, this is a company that will just, you know, they kind of uh, are, are, because of our backgrounds, kind of like enterprise selling and that kind of stuff. But you look at most of the companies we're dealing with today, a lot of them are in the startup phase. I don't want to say most, but a lot of them are in startup phase, then they move to, you know, foundation phase, and then they move to some type of an expansion phase. When you think about these four critical areas, they're all relevant in each one of these areas, but they tend to morph a little bit. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that, but it doesn't matter if you're in a startup phase, it doesn't matter if you're in a foundation phase, it doesn't matter if you're in an expansion phase, and you might call those things obviously different things. But these principles that we're gonna share with you today, I think are really, really relevant no matter where you are. Gotta be thinking about them. Okay, so let's dive in. So. Yeah. Again, we talk about we talk about it in Slack. We talk about it in our community. We talk about alignment. The word alignment, yeah, you know, figuring out what exactly it means yeah. uh, can is a long and arduous journey for most of us. When you talk about operationalizing alignment and driving functional alignment to align the sales strategy with the corporate growth strategy, how do you do that? What do you do that? What questions do you ask? Really good. I think um, I never thought that this word was going to become like a uh, buzzword, alignment. How many of you feel like that's kind of a buzzword? Yeah, so I never thought it was going to become a buzzword. It became kind of like a critical component of effectiveness. And your last presenter kind of hit on this a little bit. And, and I would be aggressive if I were you. When you're moving to different companies, when you're, you either believe what you do matters or you don't. So when I look in the eyes of men and women out there today, I can tell whether you believe what you do matters or you don't. And those actually are some of the most successful sales and marketing leaders that I've ever met are the ones that kind of believe what they do matters. But alignment, I like to break up in two different things. And, and I'll try to piggyback on the previous presentation a little bit. I look for alignment in companies. And most companies, it's rare to have alignment. But I break down alignment in two areas, executive alignment and operational alignment. So how many of you interviewed in a company and you're talking to the different executives and you can tell that that's a kind of a silo-based company? And what are some of the challenges, just scream them out, like what are some of the challenges of being in a silo-based company? What happens? What bad things happen to you? You're calling on different customers. Nobody agrees what the concept of an ideal customer is. Really good. What else? Competing you're competing priorities. So who wins? The people who have been there the longest? You should be asking these questions. What are some of the biggest initiatives the company has put forth in the last few years? Walk me through how those got funded. Walk me through how those came to light. Walk me through how you executed against them. You either believe what you do matters or you don't. You're not just looking for a job. I hope this organization, you know, being in an organization like this, it kind of gives you the spirit and the courage to know that it's, it really is all about you. Sales and marketing, Great sales and marketing is the difference between good and great. So executive alignment is big for us. We look at executive alignment, and typically executives run different parts of an organization, and those organizations then tend to become siloed because they're personalized in some way. We had a little small company, and we started the company, and I happen to be a little bit more customer-facing, and the other partner is massively good at customer facing, but way better at operational. And that's kind of how we split up the company. And we didn't fight for trying to step on each other's toes. So that's easy in the startup phase, but then everybody has an opinion as you continue to grow. So these are, I want you to write down these questions. 
I think these are fundamental questions I would ask any company. And it doesn't matter if you're transitioning to a job or if you're in a job right now, where we look for alignment is these four essential questions. The first, am I giving you what you want, by the way? Yeah, Okay. Go, good. keep going. All right, so the first question is, what problems do you solve for your customers? You wanna find alignment in the company? Walk into your next executive meeting, write these four questions up on the board and ask all the executives, if you're part of the executive team, ask them to answer these questions privately and then Take them, put them in a, you know, put them in a hat and then open them up and see what you get. So first one is, what problems do you solve for your customers? Second one is, how specifically do we solve those problems? How specifically do we solve those problems? Third one, how do we solve them differently or better than anybody else? How do we solve them differently or better than anybody else? And the fourth one, where have we done it before? Where have we done it before? My experience is these are incredible, we call them the essential questions. These are incredible examples of whether you have good alignment or you don't. And this is actually how we begin with companies. We walk into executive boardrooms, we write those four essential questions on the table or on the whiteboard, we ask them, we tell the founders that they have to go last in giving their answer. What do you think we find? If you did this in your company right now, if you did it in your company right now, we chuckle a little bit, but this should hurt your stomach because it is the single biggest differentiator from effectiveness in your organizations, sales and marketing organizations, and therefore for your companies because as goes sales and marketing, as goes a company. You agree? Okay, so if you don't have alignment on those four essential questions, you're dead in the water. You're dead and you'll have silos, you'll have different, the product people think different things, the marketing people think different things, the sales people think different things. And we find that that's the single biggest differentiator. And so we decided to focus there for alignment. So let's say we do that. And I think we've all had some experience like this in the past where we go through and we ask and everybody's got a different answer. So what is the actual process by which you drive that alignment. Well, How this do we is the get... commercial part we get to talk about ourselves and what we do. Well, I'm just saying, you know, this concept of like, like white that. collar prison. Yeah. How do you get to alignment? Like, what is the process by which you he's, get there? He's very smooth because I said, look, I don't want to come up here and just talk about force management. I'd, I mean, I wish I had the opportunity when I were your ages. I know there's some people maybe my age in here, but, you know, I really commend you guys for being it. So I wanted to give something back to you than just rather about talk about ourselves. So that was a great transition. Thank you. <laughs> But so what, but what we do is, is some, has anybody been through something called white collar prison? So a few of you in the room have been through that. What that is, is we have to get the answers to those four essential questions. And the way we engage with our clients is the fundamental answers to those four essential questions become something that's called the value framework. And the value framework then is a positioning to focusing on creating a customer experience which really understands the before state, before you even exist, before you even call on a customer, what those problems are and challenges, what the negative consequences of those are, how big is the problem, to an after state, what it could look like. And then we align it to positive business outcomes for customers. Then what we do is we teach them to take those positive business outcomes and interlace them with what we call required capabilities. And those required capabilities are the differentiated technical capabilities of your firm that are from the customer's point of view. And then we make sure the customer knows how we, you, are going to measure success. And so that framework then turns into, for sellers, turns into this concept of, okay, the company's going to build something for me that's going to teach me the positive, and then we simplify it. And any great seller really understands this. I have to understand the positive business out, we call it the three takeaways. I gotta understand the positive business outcomes of my customer before I do anything. And I can tell this, go back to your deals that you're working on, you guys in Q4 right now? And you came to this meeting, it's awesome. <laughs> It's awesome. You're either on it's top. It's the beginning of, your, of Q4. You're either on top of your business or you're sweating bullets. This isn't right December now. 14th. Okay. We did not do it then. Yeah, but so look at a deal and you can tell whether or not this is in place right now. You ask your sellers right now, what's the biggest business issue facing this customer? Write that down right now. 
go and say, what's the biggest business issue? And most of your sellers won't be able to, they haven't made the leap from their technical capabilities to the business issue facing the customer, but all the data tells us that customers care, number one, that you understand their business. Your customers care, number one. So what our methodology does is it takes the technical capabilities of a company and links them to the positive business outcomes of their customers and then creates a framework, kind of an operating rhythm. And what you heard about the white collar prison is the only way to get that done and build that framework, we gotta take the executives off site. They, we take the executives off site, they fight. You can imagine going from a silo-based company to a, uh, to, and all I would say is, just put the customer in the center of your thinking. How do you break down silos? Easiest way is put a customer either in the room or rhetorically or not literally, but put the customer in the process. And that is the first way it's going to break down silos. So we take them off site. They call it white collar prison. It takes about three and a half days but we come out of that with a framework that not only is used to train an organization, it was used originally to align the organization. How many of you would join a company today? I got a bigger question for you. How many of you joined a company and they didn't have the answers to those four essential questions? What's worse is you didn't ask them. And you're finding out now or over the last year or two or whatever, the average lifespan for you in this room, how long is it, by the way? How long? 18 months. It's 18 months. What can you get done in 18 months? That's why I'm going to encourage you. The stuff we're going to talk about today, I'm going to encourage you to get this stuff in place because your tenure should be a lot longer than that. Okay? All right. One of the things you talk about when you're talking about alignment is aligning to business level objectives that are differentiated from revenue or sales objectives. Yeah. Give us a few minutes, or just, what, what do you mean by that? Because I think that that is actually a huge pitfall for people where we're only talking about the revenue target, we're only talking about the forecast, and there's a bunch of stakeholders in the room that they, I guess they care about it, but that's not their central passion. How do we align around business objectives? That's a really good point. You know, I, I, but the good news is I can't think of any company right now that doesn't have revenue as an objective, as a business objective. And you're feeling it right now. And most of the companies have some other objectives, but everything gets trumped by revenue or profitable revenue or EBITDA, what depending upon, it's, it's all about growth and, and, and you know, what you make and what you keep. However, the most experienced sales and marketing leaders that I've ever seen have the ability to attach their collaborators so if you're kind of like a lone cowboy or cow person, uh, <laughs> if you're kind of a lone person, a lone individual, and you don't have, if I was on a board, one of the first things I would look at for you is your collaboration skills. And I would want to know your experience of how do you help others attach? So first of all, any company that doesn't have sales and marketing at the tip of the spear, because that's the closest point to the customer experience, that's not going to change forever. Now, how you go and deliver the experience to customers, that's rapidly changing. But you being a collaborator and having the ability to attach what you do to what the CFO cares about, to what the product people care about, to what the customer success people care about, to what the customer experience people care about, to, you, get, you, get the, you get the gist. So what we look for and individuals like you and what we help individuals like you do is to attach what you do for a living to make it a top three, top one, two, three part. First of all, today it's easy. It's never been such a great place to be in our profession, yours and mine. We're still doing the same thing. It's all about creating a positive customer experience. There's not one company in this room that doesn't have that in the top three. And if it doesn't have it in the top three, I would really get a stomach ache about it. You might be in the wrong company because you're gonna miss the boat. If they're not focusing on creating a great customer experience and you're not helping people kind of align to that, it's gonna be a very, very difficult situation. So that's what we mean by aligning two priorities. But make it simple, keep it simple. So give us an example. There, I think there was a time when you were coaching someone that needed to convince their CFO or just walk us through an anecdote of a, a client that you had where you were driving towards business level objectives as opposed to just revenue objectives? Well, I think the example you're speaking of is uh, a few, several years ago, we had a, somebody in your position basically tell us, hey, look, I got this. 
and it's kind of a red flag, right? So a champion that's not, a champion that is not willing to collaborate and give you access to other parts of an organization to get this alignment is a big red flag. Now, many of us wear that as a badge of courage to kind of prove to companies like ours, I can get this done. Like, you're a sales effectiveness company, I'm gonna show you how effective I am. That's like the last thing we wanna see. Because we know when it's not aligned, you know, I think there's an old saying that says, every lost deal, uh, every sold deal, every successful deal has a million fathers and mothers, right? Every lost deal has an orphan, and it's you. Right? So if you're a non-collaborator, you could be an orphan. And, and so, so in this example, what we actually did was we, we, uh, we knew that we needed to get to the CFO. We knew we needed to get to the CFO early in this example to attach it to the mentality was we need some sales initiatives, we need some sales training. They needed transformation. So, and this person was new in the company. So they hadn't gone to the CFO before. So it was a little shaky, right? But we just encourage them, and, and all of you, you can encourage your sellers too, that you know, go to the CFOs early, go to people early, and they give you advice. You with me? Go late, and they critique you. And so what we asked this person to do was to take us early to the financial people, early to understand the critical things that the company was trying to do from a financial perspective. But wait, you're a sales training company, you're a sales effectiveness company. Put that on the side for a second. What are the most critical things? And it was actually a fantastic experience for this individual because going early, the CFO gave them a tremendous amount of respect and credit. Didn't give me much respect and credit. There's actually two chairs in the room. This is a true story. There were two chairs in the room. One of them looked like this, and the other one looked like this. Which one do you think the CFO put me in? <laughs> it was this one. I actually sat in a room with a chair like this and like that, so I could kind of get a flavor for how the CFO was kind of feeling about like what I did for a living. But it wound up being a great experience because this person felt it for themselves that they needed collaboration skills, they needed to attach to bigger business issues, they, he just asked for advice. How does something like this get done in our organization? How many of you are new in the last six months of, a, of your tenure? This is what I'm talking about. Go early to people and ask for advice. You've been there 18 months. You, the reason why you don't ask for advice after 18 months is you're feeling like, God, I should already know it. Be humble. Be humble. That's thousands of years old. Go ask people for advice. You'll get great outcomes. You talk a lot about sales as a discipline that we as sales and marketing leaders, revenue leaders have to have a commitment to being truly elite. Yeah. And I think what you do is you layer in the sales effectiveness quadrant when you do that. Walk us through that framework and what you mean by that. Really cool. So I, I'm a simple guy. I got lucky. I was a college football player. I thought I was going to be a professional football player until my Hold Actually, on a second. Tell my, what, what position did you play? No, that's not important. That's not important. That's a thousand <laughs> years ago anyways. Nobody even believes I played anymore. But anyways, sales was a very similar experience because it was about discipline. It was about playbooks. It was about commitment to excellence. It was about outworking people. And for anybody out there that thinks that that's gone away, you're out of your mind. You know, the most uncommon people are the plan on the planet are the ones that are, that, that, that are willing to do the things that the common man or woman won't do. And, and, and that's why I love kind of, I, I kind of love what, what we do. But here's the point of view. It's in front of you. These four quadrants became the four areas of critical uh, effectiveness. And I think it's simple. It's, they're thousands of years old. We didn't invent them, but we just kind of packaged them into something. If you look at how this thing kind of rolls out, there's two main things that we kind of look at for companies. How you engage with your customers and how the management team operates. So really quickly, can I just walk through these yeah, real quick? Okay, let me walk through these really quick. So in the upper left-hand quadrant, it's, it's all about having command of your message. So we got marketing people in the room and we've got sales people in the room. This is the intersection of your greatness. It's the answer to those four essential questions. We start there because we believe it's so galvanizing that nothing else works in a company if you can't answer those four essential questions and then you can't come up with the playbooks and the operational methodology 
to make it consumable for the sellers and to make it consumable for your customer and your customer's experience. So that's where we start 99% of the time is in that upper left-hand quadrant. As you move down, the next thing is, how does the organization operate? And I really, really love this because the answers to those four essential questions, then they get operationalized. You need to have this in your companies. You need to have this in the next company you go to. When investors come, you need to be able to explain this to investors because this is what they're buying. So now it's about how do you deliver that customer experience? And I love going through this exercise with customers because, okay, first of all, I want to see your sales process. 99% of the people write up a sales process, but it's missing one thing. What do you think it's missing? Always. What do you think it's missing? The customer, it's always missing the customer. So the first thing I would expect to see in your sales process is the customer. But most of us in this room, and I'm not being critical, I'm trying to be encouraging, don't have the customer in our sales process. Oh, we have commitment points and they're gonna do this and they're gonna sign this piece of paper and they're gonna, uh-uh. What is the, how does the customer buy from us? How do we engage? And then I look at who's doing what when. What are the resources that we have? This is also how you appropriate your resources. Depending upon what level you're at inside of a company, excuse me, whether you're a startup, whether you're uh, found going to foundation or expansion, it's, you can't have extra resources laying around. This is the way I look at to see what people are doing. Who's doing what when? And how is that value from those four essential questions getting delivered to the customer? And then the biggest thing that I love the most is what is the customer supposed to be doing? So most of the sales organizations that we look at, they don't have something called a customer verifiable outcome. So if you really believe what you do matters, then your customer should have some decision points that they should participate in their own rescue. Most sales processes don't have that. If we do this, then the customer has to do this when, early, and often. And so we look at, we call that having command of the sale. Who's doing what when? and making sure it's aligned to the way that our customers buy, by sales stage, by customer buying stage. It makes sense, right? You guys all, I'm just trying to give you some encouragement. Most of you have a sales process, but you don't put those critical things in there like map it to the customer experience because you're gonna see some disjoint. Immediately, you're trying to get a customer to do something in this stage, but that's not the buying stage they're in. And that's why they're not buying because you're asking them in the wrong stage. So it makes sense. So that is what we call having command of the sale and engagement model. As you move over to the right here, the management operating rhythm, and the management operating rhythm is thousands of years old. Keep it simple. The greatest leaders on the planet have all had command of two things. The first one is having command of your plan, the plan to make the plan. And they have the ability to transfer that knowledge or that, that uh, passion for the plan to make them. How many of you feel like you're alone as a sales leader in the room? You're in the fourth quarter right now. Feels pretty lonely, doesn't it? And sometimes you're, you're wondering, how do I translate and transfer that urgency? And the greatest leaders I've ever seen are the ones in this kind of this plan to make the plan. They transfer the urgency down to the sales rep level, down to the seller level by creating this kind of mentality like having a franchise model that says, hey, we have a plan to make the plan for a company. We'll share that with you, but you need to create, you need to give them guidance. You need to create your plan to make the plan, like being a franchisee and we're the franchisor, and there are certain guidelines that you can help them with. We can get more specific about that. You can come find us on www.forcemanagement.com. Got a lot of free content with blogs and that kind of stuff. We try to make it simple for people. And then, do you have the ability to translate that down to a highly predictable event, a highly predictable, because you have a plan to make the plan? And by the way, the number one reason why you guys don't stay, why we don't stay in those jobs any, any more than 18 months is why? You don't make your number. And then, okay, why didn't we make the number? It's what we're talking about in all of these categories. We didn't make the number because the company wasn't aligned. We didn't make the number because we didn't have the right resources in the right place. We didn't make the number because we didn't do a good job of identifying our ideal customers and then creating these franchise models and these territories that, you with me? And then the last one is having commanded the talent. And commanded the talent is nothing more than, really analyze this. If you do these other three quadrants, 
Most people do it backwards. They go and try to recruit people to a company without these other areas of effectiveness nailed. That's the wrong way to do it. Because once you nail your message and your process and your methodology and the way that you kind of go to market and the companies that you're going to call on, then you understand what it's going to take to go build a great sales force. Companies do it backwards. They go get the wrong people, good people, but wrong people, and they're the wrong people because they don't have those experiences. So those become the four areas of sales effectiveness. That was awesome. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Last topic before we go into Q&A is some of the things that you, you've talked a lot about um, guts in our conversations, about leaders that have the guts and the urgency and the courage to drive change, to do all of these things, to implement the sales effectiveness quadrant effectively, to operationalize an alignment. What do you mean by guts and, and how do we get there? And Give us some examples of that. Okay, I'm very passionate about this topic. I'm a passionate person, so sorry. I don't mean to be screaming at you this morning, but... <laughs> I'm uh, excited. We like it. I'm, we like I'm excited it. Don't worry. To be Don't here. be so self-conscious. Okay. You're good. Right. You're doing great. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to give you this with a little love, but you got to own it. You got to have the guts to own it. A lot of people go into these jobs and they, because I said you have to have collaboration skills. Can I stand too? You may, yeah. Okay. So you got to have collaboration skills. You got to have, you know, you got to be able to build consensus at the end of the day. The people that I see are the most successful in these roles on sales and marketing side are the ones that believe that they own it. And when they show up in front of the boards, when they show up in front of the executive teams, when they show up in front of their troops, they own it. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of reasons and excuses why things don't happen. You own it. You don't necessarily have to own the success. This is the hard part. My grandmother used to say, you need the money, not the credit. So give the credit away. You with me? Give somebody else the credit. It's hard in these roles because you're trying to establish your value in such a short period of time. But I will tell you, the guts that I've seen are the ones that are say, okay, we're going to take on a sales initiative. I'm going to have, I get a little budget for training or whatever. What the heck is that going to do? You're going to bring some people in. You're going to do some discovery questions. You're going to do, once the last, you know what I'm talking about. And a lot of times you guys don't even own it. Like you're having some other departments create sales training for you. Why are you doing that? If you don't care about it, you can't care about it less than somebody else in your company. So you got to own it. You got to own the good about it. You got to own the bad about it. Okay, I don't want to lecture to you. I'm just trying to give you some spirit. The other thing that I think is gutsy is you have to focus on it's hard. You're tired. You got your families under stress. You're under stress. You got to focus on the why. The greatest leaders that I've seen, the gutsiest leaders that I've ever seen, are the ones that come to their organization and say, This is why we're doing this. Because for any great why, it makes the what and the how a lot easier. You with me? So focus on the why and give yourself some leeway with your troops. It's gutsy to go to your troops and let them fight back a little bit. There's a great book out there. I don't know if you've read it. It's called Extreme Ownership. Have you read it by Jocko? I'm probably butchering his name, Jocko Willink. I love the book because this concept of ownership, extreme ownership, was really, really powerful. And in the book, he talked about, you know, they were going to go do, and I could translate this to some business things. They're going to, he's asking his team to go do some stuff that his team doesn't really believe in. But he gave them the freedom to discuss it. But at the end of the day, his decision, her decision, we're going, and this is why. But I'd like to know why you think it's going to work or not work. That takes guts. A lot of these conversations don't take place, but if you're going to spend 18 months minimum at something, you got families, you got significant others, you've got, it's a serious profession. Why wouldn't you have the guts to do that? And then the last thing I want to do is just give you a little encouragement. Take care of yourself. Have the guts to take care of yourself. One of the biggest reasons why we don't last in these jobs is we flame out. How many of you have seen your friends flame out? Okay. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on how many of you are on the verge of flaming out. Okay. But there's three things I've learned over the last 20 years that I'd just like to share with you really quick. Have the guts to do this. And I call them, I don't call them, they're, they're, they've been around for a long, long time. The practice of gratitude. 
the practice of flow and the practice of service. The healthiest people on the planet I've ever met, regardless of job, are the people that have the, the guts to do those three things to take care of themselves. Right? The practice of gratitude is not hard. It's so simple, it's unbelievable. But the human brain is not capable of sharing gratitude and any other emotion, anxiety, fear, anger, sadness. The minute gratitude is introduced, it takes over everything. And I'm telling you, not only you, but people on your teams. If you can have an environment of grateful people, the results are just astounding. And then the next thing is the practice of flow. What happens in these jobs, what happened to me in these jobs of doing what, what you do, I have a tremendous amount of respect for what you do, is you lose your flow. And a flow state is just some kind of mental state that you can get into where you completely lose yourself. So some of you bike, some of you read, some of you fish, some of whatever it is. If you're not doing that in that 18 month stint or whatever and you put that on hold, you become unhealthy. So the greatest, most powerful people I've met on the planet, they have all three of these. Does it make sense? Some type of flow state. Now, the sad thing, if I asked you, what are you grateful for? A lot of times you start telling me about what your problems are. So that's a sign. When I ask you what your flow state is, you tell me what you like to do, but you're not doing it for the last 18 months or so. And then the last one is, to, is purposeful people. So it's the practice of service. And, and not to get too preachy, but I'm just trying to give you a little spirit. The healthiest people I've met in your roles are the ones that realize that they're doing things for others, and they think that way. You know, we, we have a mantra at Force Management that says we're helping people at Force Management that can't help themselves in both the business world and in the community, and it creates unbelievable results in the organization. So having the guts to do those kind of three things, right, to own it, to take care of yourself, and the middle one I said is to really, really focus on the why. Those were the gutsy things. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Let's give John a round of applause. Let's do, um, we've, got, we've got time for a couple of questions. Any questions, any Q&A out there? I scared the crap out of these people. Nobody wants to talk to me. <laughs> John, if, uh, if oh, we got a question from Dave. Uh, it's actually a customer testimonial. So RSA Security has been working with your company for 10 years. I joined four months ago as the head of Americas, and I participated in the white collar jail as we yes. devised things, and the <clears throat> command of the message and command of the sale, and I thought it was really excellent, really well done. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. I was give looking a forward to meeting shout you. out to Force Management. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Please. So I had a conversation earlier with Andrea, we were talking about sales and marketing alignment, and that's always a hot topic. I'm sure that many people in this room have struggled with communicating, um, with, what, depending on whether they're on the marketing or sales side. So what advice would you give when you, when you chart out your organization, you ask the four questions, what advice would you give to a sales leader? Cause that's my role yeah. uh, in, in how to, um, how to align sales and marketing. Yeah. Well, I hear the excuses all the time and I like to say the excuse department is closed. Well, I talk to sales leaders and I go talk to sales leaders and they're like, well, marketing doesn't have a clue. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, they don't create anything. They don't blah, 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 blah. And I go to the marketing people and they'll go, if the marketing, the salespeople would just read what we put together, they try to do everything one off. You guys seen the story before, right? So what I would encourage you to do is before you take these roles, how many of you just taking jobs to take jobs? Life is too short. So before you take these roles, Go meet these people. Tell me about your philosophy of putting the customer first. How do you do that? I'm talking to the marketing people. I go to the marketing people. Give me some examples of what we already have. You know what happens in marketing? They last a little bit longer than the salespeople. They have all of these materials and a new seller comes in, new salesperson comes in and says, we're gonna do it this way. And they try to throw everything out the window. That's ludicrous. You go find out what each other's doing. You put a customer in the room. What I would do is I'd go bring a customer or bring your best customer or go visit a customer and go talk to them about the things that are critical for them. Both of you go or both departments go. And that way you bring down these silos, put a customer at the, fort, the front of your uh, thinking and things will become clear. Think in each other's shoes. The marketing people are been tasked. Do you know how they're tasked? Do you know how they're measured? If you're a seller and you don't know that, you don't have a partner and you're not being a good partner. If you're a marketing person and you don't go to the seller, 
and ask the same questions. At the end of the day, when your organizations come together, very, very powerful things take place. You should be a part of the interview process. You should be a part of the recruiting process. That's my suggestion to you. No matter where you are and what stage, it's never too late to go. You can always go and fall on your sword. I think it's easier for sellers to fall on their swords because they do it every day. You go to the marketing people and say, hey, look, I want to understand from your perspective what you're being asked to do, what you're being tasked to do, and why I want to know how we can make your job easier. It never happens. It's uncommon. Most of the sales leaders in the room, they haven't done that, and you're just missing a great opportunity. My marketing people and my company, they run the company. Because for us, it's all about creating a customer experience, and we don't know what that experience is unless we understand the customer. So that's my suggestion. John, if uh, folks want to reach out to you, get in touch with you, what's uh, your preferred method of communication? www.forcemanagement.com. You'll find all of us on the website. Uh, I'm Jay Kaplan at forcemanagement.com. But I would encourage you to, uh, first of all, I'm really fired up for you. I'm serious. I never had anything like this when I was your ages. Uh, and I'm not, you know, You're not, I'm not that, that old. old. I'm not that old. But what I'm saying is, hey, 10, 15 years ago, these things didn't exist. And so, you know, I really, really encourage you. What I like about what we do for a living is we put all this content, a lot of it up on, like you do, and we've shared. You guys brought us in to do some blogs and that kind of stuff, which we thank you for. But it's all free content. If you have any questions, go consume that content. If you have any questions, just reach out to us. We'd love to interact with you. Thanks, Thanks for having Sean. us. Thanks, Sean. Let's give him a round of applause. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hey everybody, it's Sam Jacobs. This is the Sales Hacker Podcast and you're listening to Sam's Corner. I really hope you liked that interview and that discussion with John Kaplan, the president and co-founder of Force Management. I think, you know, they talk about this concept of white collar prison and the purpose of sort of confining everybody in that way is really to drive consistent messaging. And, you know, a lot of different folks always have this, this story of going around and asking 10 different people in an organization, what is the company's missions, what are its values, and everybody giving a different answer. And it may seem trivial or it may seem uh, unimportant, but it really is a critical feature of well-executing organizations on the go-to-market side. Their ability to align messaging, to understand who their buyer is, to understand what is the ROI, what is the return that the buyer can expect based on the, their ability to solve that business problem. And you can understand that, you know, even to putting aside all of John's enthusiasm and passion, understanding and just that level of empathy of focusing on the buyer, putting the customer at the center of the organization, not thinking about features in terms of the things that you've built and you're so proud of, but thinking about features as a means to an end of solving somebody's business problem. That will never steer you wrong in the game of sales. So I thought that conversation with John was excellent. If you're interested in learning more about Forest Management, feel free to take them to check them out online. It's forcemanagement.com. Before we go, we want to thank our sponsors. Uh, the first is Vidyard. Video is the new future of communication. Email isn't dead, but it sure is boring. Add video to your emails to stand out in the inbox for free with Vidyard. Go to vidyard.com forward slash sales hacker for more information. Our second sponsor is Outreach, the leading sales engagement platform. And of course, if you want to reach me, you can linkedin.com forward slash the word in and then forward slash Sam F. Jacobs. And talk to you soon. Bye. I catch a smile.